In our last lecture, we looked at the translational symmetry of two-dimensional patterns. And as we discussed, the translational symmetry is the defining characteristic of a crystal. In this lecture, we're going to take those ideas and we're going to extend them into three dimensions, which is, of course, the dimensional space in which most real crystals exist. In three dimensions, there are a total of seven primitive Brave lattices, and those lattices are shown here. Remember from last time, a primitive Brave lattice is one where we have a lattice point only at the vertices or corners of the unit cell. Now in three dimensions, the unit cell is an object called a parallelopiped, right? That's a six-sided figure, and each face of that figure is a parallelogram of some sort. We can divide these seven Brave lattices into the three shown at the top, which have orthogonal lattice vectors. That is, A, B, and C, the lattice vectors, are all perpendicular to one another. The cubic Brave lattice, which is probably the most symmetric Brave lattice, is a very easy to visualize. I think everybody knows what a cube is. You can see that each of the six faces, they're all squares, and that means that the lattice vectors all have equivalent lengths. When we go to the tetragonal lattice, now the C lattice vector is of a different length than A and B. And what that does is it leaves two of the six sides as squares, but the other four sides become rectangles. And then when we go to the orthorhombic Brave lattice, we see that the three lattice vectors are all three of different lengths. And so now all six faces of the unit cell become rectangles. Then we move down to the lower four Brave lattices. And in all of these, we find that not all three lattice vectors are perpendicular to one another. So starting on the left, we see the rhombohedral lattice. And the rhombohedral lattice can be obtained from a cube by basically stretching along one of the body diagonals, right? So all three lattice vectors are the same length, and the angles between them, alpha, beta, and gamma, are the same. But that angle is not equal to 90 degrees. Then we have the hexagonal Brave lattice, and this can be understood quite simply from the two-dimensional hexagonal lattice, remember, which had this very specific sort of rhombus as the unit cell. If we add a third lattice vector, C, that is perpendicular to the other two lattice vectors, we get this hexagonal lattice shown here. And then we can go to the monoclinic Brave lattice. Now we're getting down to pretty low symmetry. The base of a monoclinic unit cell is going to be an arbitrary parallelogram. Okay, so that means that A and C are not equal to each other, and the angle between them is arbitrary. And then the third lattice vector, which by convention is B, will be perpendicular to the other two. So you can see in this unit cell we have four rectangular faces, and then we have two faces that are parallelograms. And the lowest symmetry Brave lattice is called triclinic, and in this one there are no special relationships between the lattice vectors. So each face of this unit cell is just a parallelogram. Now, as we saw in two dimensions, we can have centered lattices, but when we go to three dimensions, there's actually more than one way to obtain a centered lattice. So let's look at a primitive orthorhombic unit cell shown here in the upper left. There's a lattice point only at each corner. If we wanted to generate a centered lattice from this, one option would be to put a lattice point at the very center of the unit cell. That might be the most obvious kind of centering to you. And that's shown in the lower left. And now we see that we have two lattice points per unit cell, one at the corners and one at the body centered. So this is called a body-centered lattice. Uh, it's given the symbol I. And we have to remember that when we have a crystal with a body-centered lattice, that for every atom in the crystal, 
there has to be another identical atom that's displaced by one half A plus one half B plus one half C. Right? That's the distance from the corner to the body center. The volume of the body-centered lattice has got to be twice that of the primitive lattice because we now have doubled the number of lattice points per unit cell. Another way that we might create a centered lattice is that we could put a second lattice point at the center of two opposite faces, and that's called a base-centered lattice. And the conventional setting for a base-centered lattice is one where that extra lattice point goes into the face that is perpendicular to the C-axis. Okay, we would call that a C-centered lattice. And in that case, for every atom in the unit cell, we have to have an equivalent atom in the unit cell that's connected by the same vector that goes from the origin to the base center. And that would be one-half A plus one-half B. There are non-standard settings where we might put the extra lattice point in another face. So if the extra lattice point goes in the center of the face that is perpendicular to the B axis, that would be a B-centered lattice. And if it goes into the faces that are perpendicular to the A axis, we would call that an A-centered lattice. And then finally, we have an example that is familiar to many people, and that is where we put an extra lattice point at the center of each of the six faces, as shown in the lower right. And that's called a face-centered lattice. And in this lattice, if you think about it for a minute, we have you know, one lattice point at the corners. We have one lattice point at each of the six faces. And those lattice points at the faces, they're you know, halfway in the unit cell. Half of them is in this unit cell and half in the neighboring unit cell. So six times one half would be three, and then we have that other lattice point at the corners. So in a face-centered lattice, we have a total of four lattice points per unit cell. And as such, its volume would be four times that of a primitive unit cell. Now the vectors connecting the origin to those other three lattice points are shown below. One half A plus one half B. We have one half A plus one half C and then one half B plus one half C. Okay, so that's a face-centered lattice. And these are the ways you can have centered lattices in three dimensions. Now, just as in two dimensions, we saw that not every primitive lattice has a centered lattice, we find the same thing happens in three dimensions. So this table here shows the different shapes, if you will, of the Brave lattice and um, the primitive lattices, and then it shows where we have centering. So we see that only in an orthorhombic lattice can we have all three types of centering. In the other types of primitive lattices, we can only have certain types of centering. And when you add it all up, we end up with 14 different Brave lattices in three dimensions. Okay, so those are the basis of the translational symmetry that we're going to have in three-dimensional crystals. We can visualize those different Brave lattices here. And so this shows all, all 14 Brave lattices. It also summarizes the, the vectors that connect the lattice point at the corner with the centering lattice points. Now let's take a little bit closer look at some of the centered lattices. Just as we saw with the rhombus in two dimensions, gives a lattice that normally we would describe as a centered rectangular lattice, and that means that we can draw both a centered unit cell and a primitive unit cell. We can draw primitive unit cells for these three-dimensional centered lattices. I show here maybe the most familiar example, this is the face-centered cubic lattice. And you see I've got a lattice point at each corner and then on the center of each face. This parallelopiped that's shown in red is the primitive unit cell. We see that the lattice vectors here go from the lattice point at the origin to each of the lattice points on 
the centers of the faces. This unit cell here, which is the primitive unit cell, um, has lattice vectors that are smaller than the cubic unit cell by, divided by square root of 2, and then the angles between the lattice vectors are, are equal to 60. This unit cell is going to be one-fourth the volume of the cubic unit cell. Now, most of the time, we're not going to use these primitive unit cells for the centered lattices, but there are times, for example, when you're doing calculations where it's advantageous to have a smaller cell, and we might use the primitive unit cell. There's one more kind of centering that I want to talk about that we didn't touch on earlier in this lecture, and that is when you have a hexagonal unit cell, it is possible to have a rhombohedral centering of that unit cell. And that rhombohedrally centered hexagonal cell is shown here. You can see that we have lattice points at each corner of the unit cell. Those are all marked with a 1. But then we have two additional lattice points per unit cell. This lattice point number 2 is obtained by translating 2 thirds A plus 1 third B plus 1 third C up to this point. If we have yet a third lattice point here, 3, which is 1 third A plus 2 thirds B plus 2 thirds C. Okay, and you can see that these three atoms, 1, 2, and 3, are all on the body diagonal of this unit cell. But the question is, how is this unit cell related to that primitive rhombohedral unit cell we saw a couple of slides back? And that is shown here. So what I've done is I've plotted four of these rhombohedrally centered hexagonal cells, right? each of them having the same dimensions as a hexagonal unit cell. But if we start at the origin here and we connect the way that these blue lines are shown, we get a smaller unit cell, which is a primitive rhombohedral unit cell. And as we'll see later, you know, the defining symmetry element of a rhombohedral unit cell would be a single threefold axis along the body diagonal. And of course, we learned in the last lecture that for a hexagonal unit cell, we can have a threefold axis as well. And in three dimensions, that threefold axis would be parallel to the C direction that is vertical in this figure. And so what we see is that the vertical C axis of the hexagonal unit cell is the long body diagonal of the rhombohedral unit cell. So we're going to call this Brave lattice a rhombohedral lattice, but we have to keep in mind that we could and often do choose to use a larger hexagonal unit cell that is centered in such a way that there are three lattice points per unit cell. Now, before we finish up, let's go back to this question of, you know, we have seven different primitive Brave lattices. We have three different kinds of centering. So you might think that we could get you know, 7 times 4 Brave lattices, and that would be 28 Brave lattices. But in fact, we only have half that number, only 14. So why in some crystal systems do we not see certain kinds of centering? And the reason is because in those crystal systems, we could create a centered lattice, but once we do so, it would be possible to draw a smaller unit cell that retains the symmetry characteristics of that lattice, but isn't centered. So let's do an example here. This is, as drawn, a base-centered tetragonal unit cell. Right? And what I would like you to do is to redraw this unit cell so that it's still tetragonal, but it's not a C-centered or base-centered lattice anymore. I'll stop for a minute. I want you to give this a try, and then come back, and I'll go through the answer. What did you get? Well, it turns out that you can draw a smaller unit cell that is still tetragonal but primitive. Okay, And that unit cell I'm going to show here. 
All right, if you look at this unit cell, we see that the base of the unit cell is still a square. The sides are still rectangles. This has the dimensions of a tetragonal Brave lattice, a tetragonal unit cell. And you know what? It's only half the volume. So since we can draw a smaller unit cell that's primitive, we would always choose to do so. And you can use this same kind of thinking to rationalize why we don't have, for example, a body-centered monoclinic lattice or other uh, examples that were missing from that table we saw a few slides back.